and Nemesis was the goddess of retribution. She personified the power that visited punishment on those guilty of wrongdoing. Some myths feature her as human-like, but often she was conceptualized as an omnipresent force rather than a physical entity. Her power functions something like moral gravity, only punishing instead of pulling. When a person jumps, gravity pulls them back down to Earth. And similarly, under the auspices of Nemesis, when a person did something bad, they were punished. Nemesis was the bane of those who disrupted the natural order. Those most at risk of bringing down her power upon themselves were the hubristic, disrespecting the gods, the wicked, in all their myriad forms, and the inordinately lucky. Her fundamental purpose was to maintain equilibrium, the balance of things. She personified the desire for retribution society felt towards wrongdoers and towards those whose good fortune was excessive or undeserved. People who perpetrated evil and people who were ridiculously lucky found themselves in her crosshairs, as did people who didn't respect the stark divide between divinity and mortality, challenging the gods or thinking themselves equal to or greater than them. Perhaps a good analogy is Nemesis as a topiarist and equilibrium as a tree that's constantly being tended and pruned. If the tree grows too tall, someone guilty of hubris, then the top is lopped off. If part of the tree is withered or rotten, someone who is evil, then that part is cut away. And if there's errant growth, an offshoot that becomes incongruent with the whole, someone whose luck is excessive or meritless, then that growth is excised. It was her prerogative and solemn duty to press her thumb down on these scales on which good fortune and misfortune were counterpoised, curtailing happiness and unhappiness as needed. In appearance, Nemesis was often portrayed as a beautiful, stern woman. Her beauty was not of a gentle kind, but commanding, a kind that brooked no challenge and suffered no fool befitting the goddess who was retribution incarnate. Her attributes, depending on the portrayal, include wings, a chariot, a sword and whip, a wheel, and a crown or diadem. The wings in the chariot emphasized her ubiquitous influence, able to carry out swift justice, any place, any time. The sword and whip, tools of death and pain, symbolize her role in meeting out punishment and enforcing balance. The wheel emphasized the unpredictable nature of the world, good and bad as unpredictable as the sea and the sky. And lastly, the head adornment symbolized her divinity and authority. Nemesis's varied inclusions in Greek mythology can be divided into two categories. Information that pertains to the genealogy of Greek mythology, where parents and children were, and myths that involve her punishing people for the reasons discussed earlier. We'll begin with the former and finish with the latter. Nemesis was the daughter of Nyx, the personification of night. Through parthenogenesis, meaning asexual reproduction, a composite derived from the Greek word parthenos, virgin, and genesis, origin or birth, Nyx independently procreated a multitude of children. None of them were outright evil, but many of them embodied several of the unpleasant realities of the human condition. Unavoidable symptoms of being finite and imperfect. Gods like Apati, Deceit, Oises, Misery, Geras, Old Age, Eris, Strife, Momus, Blame, Moras, Doom, Thanatos, Death, and others. There are also versions in which Nemesis is the daughter of Nyx and Erebus, Darkness, Oceanus, the great river that encircles the world, and Zeus himself. Concerning her children, the most salient story is that she, in some versions, was the mother of Helen, the Queen of Sparta, who became a princess of Troy after Paris abducted her, her abduction precipitating the Trojan War. She caught Zeus's eye and stirred his loins, but the attention wasn't welcome and the eventual coupling was forced. She was determined to evade him and managed to do so for a time. The chase happened over land and sea. On land, she transformed into fleet-footed beasts, racing across plains and over mountains. In the sea, she transformed into swift creatures, 
piercing waves and cutting through the depths. But Zeus matched her resolve, dogged as she was desperate. He eventually caught her, and when he did, she was overmatched, his power the greater. This unfortunate chain of events is one that harkens back to the early sources of Greek mythology. Later sources give additional details. According to one, Nemesis took the form of a goose to elude Zeus. This tactic, though, only worked temporarily, for Zeus did the same, taking the form of a swan. Because both of them were birds when Zeus finally sated his lust, Nemesis, instead of giving live birth, laid an egg, which was found by a herdsman. He, in turn, gave the egg to Leda, a princess who married the Spartan king Tyndareus. Leda kept the egg in a box, and when it hatched, Helen emerging from the broken shell, Leda claimed her as her own, raising her as a daughter. And now transitioning to the second category, Nemesis typically wasn't someone whose eye you wanted drawn to you. It meant you had incurred her attention by compromising the natural order, disrespecting the gods, perpetrating wickedness or misdeeds of some sort, benefiting from inordinate good fortune, possibly by tempting fate and coming out unscathed, or for some other reason that was deemed disruptive. That said, Nemesis was, overall, a positive and necessary force, a net good. Testament to this is that humanity's darkest hour was said to follow her departure from the earth, forsaking mortal man for the abode of the deathless gods. The passage that describes this comes in Works and Days, written by Hesiod. It tells of the five ages of man, which were five distinct periods when different races of people lived in different circumstances, these ranging from blissful to barbaric. The five ages were the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, the Heroic Age, and the Iron Age. The First Age was the Golden Age, under the rule of the Titan Cronus. During this period, people lived in peace and harmony, and the earth provided food in abundance without the need for labor. The weather was always pleasant, and people lived to a very old age, far beyond the span of our own years, blessed by the vigor and vitality of youth until the very end. Deaths were peaceful passings, devoid of fear or pain, and the spirits of the deceased lived on as guardians. The Silver Age was inferior to the Golden Age. During this time, humans remained children for 100 years and then grew up quickly and lived but a short time as adults. This age was characterized by ineptitude and by impiety towards the gods. Displeased, Zeus eventually destroyed this race. The Bronze Age was marked by men of bronze, created by Zeus. They were brutal and belligerent, destroying themselves through constant warfare. They were imperfect creations whose quarrelsome and combative nature spared the maker the trouble of disposing of them. The Heroic Age was a more noble period when demigods and heroes walked the earth. Well-known events from this age include any of the stories involving the heroes of old. The Trojan War, Odysseus's return voyage to Ithaca, the exploits of Hercules, the adventures of the Argonauts, Perseus's slaying of Medusa, and so on. This age was a time of honor and nobility, of mighty heroes and fell foes, great deeds and tragic loss laced throughout. The Iron Age, the age Hesiod claimed to be living in when he wrote the poem, was characterized by toil and misery. Humans were saddled with hard lives, and morality was in decline. Strife and suffering marked this age. People were unscrupulous and untrustworthy. Wickedness and barbarity intensified with each generation. The world was caught in the downward spiral of inexorable regression. The fabric of civilization unraveled humanity reverting back to some liminal purgatory, degenerating to a primitive developmental state between man and beast. The travail and tragedy of day-to-day -day living withered body and spirit, and the ravages of time extinguished life, claiming all those fortunate enough, or unfortunate enough, to see their hair gray and their skin sag and wrinkle. Conflict was rife, negative forces like envy and violence waxed, and positive forces like order and justice waned. Punctuating all of this was the departure of Nemesis and of Eidos, shame. 
and then Eidos and Nemesis, with their sweet forms wrapped in white robes, will go from the wide path to earth and forsake mankind to join the company of the deathless gods. And bitter sorrows will be left to mortal men, and there will be no help against evil. Another testament to Nemesis being a force for good comes in the Orphic hymn dedicated to her. It describes her as a mighty queen, one whose omniscient sight observes all the doings of the world, taking note whenever something went awry. When the world was disturbed by unbalance and disharmony, Nemesis witnessed what transpired and would course correct accordingly, most often unleashing her power to punish wickedness. Those who perpetrated evil were her prey, stalked by her power, like a bow whose arrows always found the heart of its target, regardless of where or when they were fired. While those who lived righteously held her in the highest reverence, knowing that it was her wont to mete out swift justice, curing the ills of the world. In Hesiod's work, her leaving the world to be with the gods symbolizes the departure of righteous retribution from the world, signifying the complete dissolution of the moral and ethical ethos. In the Orphic hymn dedicated to her, she's described as ubiquitous, espying every instance of inequity and injury that warranted her intercession, giving the impression of an all-pervading power. And in this same vein, other myths present her as the mechanism of retribution rather than the one who actually carries out retribution. Two examples of this are Erisichthon and Narcissus, and we are going to wrap up the video by going over both. Erisichthon was an impious king, and he wanted a new banquet hall. The timber to build it came from the goddess Demeter's sacred grove. The loss of her trees pained Demeter, whose ire it was intensifying, like locked earth before a quake. The king was warned, advised to desist, lest he incite the wrath of the gods. But he was reckless and entitled, undaunted by the divine. The warning fell on deaf ears, evoking anger instead of contrition. The king exclaimed, These trees shall make my tight dwelling, wherein evermore I shall hold pleasing banquets enough for my companions. Nemesis watched all that happened, recording the conduct of the king, who was cursed by Demeter with insatiable hunger. Here, Nemesis doesn't do the cursing, it's more like she's the authority that sanctions the curse, maybe inspiring the idea, maybe endowing potency. A similar dynamic can be seen in the story of Narcissus, this story living on in infamy. He was an incredibly handsome man. Women quickly became besotted by the mere sight of him, as was the case with the nymph Echo, whose heart was ensnared by his beauty the moment her eyes took in his form. She made bold advances and was rebuffed harshly, cruelly even. A narcissist exclaimed, Keep your arms from me, be off, I'll die before I yield to you. Grief-stricken, rendered despondent by the invective of unsparing rejection, Echo fled. She retreated into the wilderness. There, alone, she diminished until almost nothing was left of her only a passionless voice that called back what others said, and mimicked the cries of beasts, and repeated the sounds of the wild, tumbling rock, falling tree, and other disturbances. Echo faded to nothing more than a forlorn voice. Though her end was pitiful, it would still be some time before Narcissus met his comeuppance. Many others were to be scorned as she was, and this continued unpunished, until one jilted youth, the love drained from his heart, as a person is of their blood from a mortal wound, cursed Narcissus. He prayed that Narcissus never love or be loved. The prayer was answered, invoking the power of Nemesis. Narcissus became enamored by his own reflection. He was transfixed, unable to avert his gaze even for a moment. Vanity bound him with the shackles of obsession. Chains and bars could not have done more. There, at the pool's edge, entranced and enraptured, Spellbound by the sight of himself, he wasted away to nothing. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.